So they need that to grow up with. And I was blessed to have that. You know, my parents have been married over 50 years now. My grandparents celebrated their 70th year anniversary not too long ago. Today that's unheard of in today's society. But I want us to look at fathers for a minute to this, this morning in the presence of being available, being present. We're going to take our text from Genesis. In Genesis chapter 18, we see where God is talking about giving the children to Abraham. And that's where we're going to start with our text from this morning. Go ahead would, just stand and reverence the word of God, please. And it says, For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we call upon you this morning to be with us in this time, Lord, to watch over us, Lord, to fill us with your spirit, dear God, to open our hearts, dear Father, so that we may hear what you have to say. Lord, move me out of the way and preach this message to your people, dear Father. Open us, dear God, and just let us receive what you have to say and to use it into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We see, God chose Abraham to command his children. Why? Because Abraham had a heart. He loved children. He, he chose Abraham to raise the children right, and he instructed him that way. And we're going to look at that this morning, but I want you to, for just a moment, I pulled up some statistics from a survey that was census survey that was done in 2018. And it says the father absence crisis in America. 18.4 million children are without biological or adopted fathers in America today. Because of that, research shows that when a child is raised in a father absent home, they are affected in the following ways. They are four times great, greater risk of poverty, more likely to have behavioral problems, two times greater risk of infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager, more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, two times more likely to have suffer obesity, and two times more likely to drop out of high school. That was a survey done by the Census Bureau in 2018 on America with fatherless children. Now, there's many more slides that went after that. I just took one of the, that spoke about everything I wanted to look at. And it shows you what happens when a father is not home. What happens in a father's house when he's not there to discipline the child. Now today there are some parents, some kids that have both parents. But even having both parents, the father still absent because he refuses to be a father. He just wants to be a best friend. 
or vice versa. You know, and that's, you can't be that. God called the, the husband to be head of the household. You know, and that was one thing I was trying to find something to come up with family because I came up with part of it, father, uh, father and mother in loving. I couldn't find anything to come up with a why. I don't know what word in a why, but father and mother make up a family. You think about it. It's the first two parts in loving, in a loving home. That's a family, a father and a mother in a loving home. That's what kids need today, especially in today's time. There are more and more kids that are raised during the time of absent parents. Now, during the 1860s, I don't know if y'all heard of Billy Sunday. He was a great baseball player. He was drafted to the Chicago White Sox. And during that time, he had been going around and he was walking home one day and he heard a song being sung in a church that reminded him of his mother. Where The song has something to do with, where is my son today? And he walked into the church and gave his life to the Lord. And shortly after that, God called him to be a preacher. And like you see right there, Billy Sunday was one of the greatest preachers of his time. They said he was as good as John the Baptist. He had engagements all across every major city in America. They said that he had preached over 100 million people and led over a million people to Christ. That's great, right? But while he was preaching, the life at home was struggling. It was a practice on Sunday mornings for the Sundays to leave their kids with a nanny while they went to the ministry field. They didn't take their kids with them. They left them with a the nanny. There wasn't any heart-to-heart -heart relationship with him and his sons. And after some time, it was apparent that his boys were doing a living, and they were living the life that he was preaching against. You know, you all always heard the attache, the cliche of a preacher's child, preacher's kids. They always live exactly what the preacher's preaching against. Well, this is why they say that, because his sons went around mocking him. He was a, Sunday was a devout Christian, but his three sons were not. They mocked him. They had horrible family lives, one of which died by committing suicide. Now, this is the greater, one of the greater preachers of the time. Let me bring it a little closer to our time. Nelson Mandela, after 27 years in prison for apartheid, I believe that's how you say it, you know, he preached against it, he rallied against it. He was in jail for 27 years, and while he was in there, his kids didn't meet him, didn't know him. When he got out of prison, he was taken away. And his son said to a, to a uh, reporter one time that he was just taken away. And we never met him after that. We didn't see him. Because he was sent off as to go talk to dignitaries to talk to fight, you know, leaders around the world for human rights. The only problem was he wasn't home. He didn't, you know, he wasn't home. His own sons would tell their younger sister not to wait for daddy. He's not coming home. They would tell her not to look up to him. He won't be there. You see, one son died tragically in a car accident. The other one died from AIDS, never knowing their father. Later in life, his daughter would come in her later years to say she didn't know if her father really loved her. She restored a relationship with him, but it was never a father-daughter relationship because he spent more time worrying about everybody else's children and everybody else's families except for his own. You see, people put on a public face, but what happens at home is where it counts. Amen. And you see in 1 Timothy, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, you think about that for a minute. If we look at our, our country today, we can look at third world countries and say that's normal. But, you know, the third world countries are looking at America and they're like, what is going on over there? Amen. Because we are worse off than they are. I spent three weeks, a little over three weeks in Africa. And what I've seen over there, 
America can learn a lot from. The respect they have for each other. Yeah, that government's corrupt. But the respect they have for each other, the love they have for each other, the family atmosphere that they had inside the family. <clears throat> Even though their culture is different from ours, it was different, but they respect each other. You, know, you didn't see any of these stuff that we have in America around there. You didn't. Because they didn't, they, that was, their culture didn't put up with it. But they had, you know, they had some times where the kids didn't have a father, but there was always a, fe a male figure to be there for them. That was one thing I did notice. Like you'd have one chief and he'd have six wives and 20 kids. Which, you know, I asked that guy, I was like, why? Wow. But hey, that's their culture. But each kid helped raise the next kid and so on and so forth. But they always had someone there to keep them in line, keep them disciplined. We don't have that here. Why? Because we're raising a, a generation of lazy people that don't want to stick around. It's too much responsibility to be a parent these days. It's too hard. You know, when we look at it, I looked at one statistic. It talked about uh, Mississippi, then Louisiana, and then Alabama was the three worst states when it came to, I believe it was, fatherless homes right there. Mississippi was number one, Louisiana was second, and Alabama was third. And it came to fatherless homes. And you think about that when you look at what the kids are growing up today to be like. And we wonder why we have the problems we do today. It's because daddies don't want to be there. You see, the word nurture, when we look at the word nurture, it covers a lot of things. It covers the idea of a relationship. God wants that relationship with his people. He wants that father-son, father-daughter relationship. You know, when Jesus touched the girl, that the lady that had been bleeding for 12 years, when he touched her, he called her daughter. He called her daughter. Why? Because she didn't have that. She was, her own family kicked her out of the village. She could be, her family banned her from coming to see him. And she felt alone, rejected by her own family, her own mother and father. So to hear that from him, meant everything and see that's what he wants with us he wants that father daughter relationship with us but you see the problem we run in today is we live in that busy busy era where dads and moms are constantly working and I understand that the younger parents they're trying to build the, the careers build the house or get it all set up but when you're a young mom and a young dad it's hard it struggles and that's where as grandparents, that's where we, you're supposed to come in and help them during those times. But to give them advice. But they're doing their best. But sometimes they get so busy, they forget what they're missing. And that's the little ones right there beside them. <coughs> that just won't do, want nothing to do but just sit down and have time with them. They have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with their parents. You know, that's the thing. A lot of people are missing that. A lot of kids are missing that because they don't know what it's like to sit down and just talk to mom and dad today. You know why? Because PlayStation, iPads, TVs, and cell phones are raising them. You know, and it's true. It's true. You know, dad instituted something a long time ago on Sunday dinners. When we go sit down at dad's table at the Sunday dinner, cell phones don't come to the table. Amen. He doesn't allow us to have cell phones at the table. Doesn't matter if it's a 911 text or not, that cell phone stays over there. You know, that's the thing. And that's what we have to do. We have to get back to that sometimes. You know, we need to get back to that. Because you look at America in the 1950s and America in 2023. Look at the values, how drastic the values changed from just a simple, a simple thing of sitting at the table together right. to eat. Just something that simple. And now where we are, we're all, all over the house. We eat in three different parts of the house. You know, the thing is, we're not together. And the truth is, the parents really don't know who their kids are today. Do you know what kind of music they listen to? Do you know what who they're talking to on all these social media outlets? What are they doing when you're not around? You know, that's the thing. We're what are our kids like today? Are we raising them the way they should be? 
I know there's so much more out there and it is harder for people to be parents today than it was when a lot of y'all were because there's so many more temptations out there when you give them a cell phone. You can block it the best way you can find. You can put all the bloggers on it, but there's still ways around it. But the thing is, children don't know who their parents are either. Why? They're never home. They're too busy. They're gone. They're at work. All the time. You know, I know when I was first starting out with the UAV program back in 06, for the first four years of that, we I traveled every month. I was gone all the time because we was working with people trying to get things off the ground with it. And it was just nonstop. And I missed a lot. You know, that was one thing when Ethan was born. I didn't get to meet Ethan until he was a year and a half old because I missed all that time. I was gone. So you miss those things because why we put work first instead of our family. It's time for us to get back to putting family first. We've got to put God back in the family. So how do we change this trend? How do we change it? Well, let's look at how fathers are supposed to bring up their children. Discipline them in the way they're taught. Don't bring them up in anger. Discipline them. Teach them the ways that God has taught us. Teach them what's right, what's wrong. Instill a morality inside them. Instill a set of values that they can have. Because a lot of things we're dealing with today, the problem we're dealing with today is there's no values. The value of life doesn't mean anything today. I mean, you talk to police officers in Alexandria, and they'll tell you that it's normal for that street over there to have a shooting at least twice or three times a week. It's normal. And I was like, because I was videoing it one day, and I, I called the cops and said, listen, you might want to come here. There's two guys literally right in front of my bus about to shoot each other. And he's like, it's normal. They do it all the time. It's like, okay. But, you know, that's just, that's what our world has come to, where we call murder normal. When the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about, you know, there were some people that were just getting out of prison that was put in prison for marijuana in the 70s and they're just now getting out and people go to jail in other states that, for murder and they get 10 to 15 years. The value of life has dropped because while we have long, we have put God second. Fathers have quit instilling values in their family. You know, it starts in the home. It has to start in the home. The first thing that we have to do is time. Give time to them. You know? In order to build a relationship with our kids, we got to have time. Spend time with them. Go places. I know there are a lot of families. I see them. I see pictures on Facebook. They go out. They do a lot of time with their kids. And that is great. That's what we should do. Spend time with them. Because when they get older, that's what they're going to remember. That bond they have with their family. That's time, because that's what they're going to do with their kids, and so forth and so on. And that's how it should be. It's no matter how bad or how busy you are, the kids need their time. They need you. You know, like I was telling earlier, because the it, decades ago, it was a simple thing of sitting at the dinner table. That was a great opportunity to build a relationship. But because we live in that eat and run philosophy, no one sits at the table anymore. I mean, we do. We eat. We That's today's philosophy. We, when's the last time y'all stopped just to sit down and eat together? I mean, we do it on special occasions. But let's just think. A random Tuesday out of the week. When's the last time somebody just randomly out of the week just went somewhere with the family and just sat down and ate? Not for vacation. Not for anything. Just sit down and ate together. Whether it's at the house or somewhere. Just sit down. Put the cell phones on off. Throw them off to the side and just have family time. You know what? I'll throw another one out there. Play a game. Board game. Lord, you mentioned board game to kids these days. They look at you like you're crazy. What is that? Like, it doesn't have electronics? No. You don't have to put batteries in it, charge it? No. Yeah, you bring out Monopoly and they look like you're crazy. Yeah, Monopoly takes you forever to play that game. 
But you think you still that's what but that's what we grew up like. We grew up with board games. Why? Because it was a family thing. We sat down together and did it. Just something simple like that. But you know what's even more important than that? Is reading the Bible together. When do the families sit down together and read the Bible? Maybe during Christmas time, they may read the Christmas story to them. Maybe if they're lucky. But as a family, we've got to get back to that. You know, that's where source of men, you are head of the household. That is your job. God puts you ahead of the house. There's only one person ahead of the man, and that's Christ. And ahead of Christ is God himself. That's why marriage was so important in the very beginning that, you know, God created man and woman. Man and woman to raise the children. Today we have men and men raising children, women and women raising children, but the and kids are so messed up, so confused, they don't know what's going on. Their moral compass is wrong because they don't know what right and wrong looks like anymore. But you see, the, another biggest thing is fathers have to be active. They have to be present in a child's life. They need to be available. That's the biggest thing is the being there. Second is communication. You know, fathers, you have to, and mothers, the talk. <laughs> We've all heard of the talk. Well, yeah, you got to have communication with your kids, whether it's the talk or it's just talking with them. Sit down, listening to them on how bad their sunburn is after a three-hour day in the pool. It hurts so bad. But, you know, just listening to them, stuff like that, and talking with them, or listening to one of them give you random facts on a daily basis that you don't know where they come from, about whales. But, you see... That's what you got to do. You got to listen to the kids. Why? Because they want you to listen to them. I remember as a kid, dad would sit there and I'd just be like, da, 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 da. I would talk his ear off. But that's that's what we need to do as parents. We just sit there and listen to them. Because why? That opens up that communication because kids want that with us. And guess what, yo? Our Heavenly Father wants that same way too. Amen. Right. He wants us to do the same thing. We can talk to our human fathers and mothers all day long, but when it comes to stopping and talking to God, we treat it like it's the plague, and we got to script it out so much that it has to be done the same way every time. That if we deviate from that prayer, we're scared God's not going to listen to us. Prayer is just a common communication conversation like you're having right now. That's what prayer is. Yeah, and the thing is, our kids are talking to us. And you know, when the Bible talks about, Jesus talks about to love, be like the children. Just like children talk to you. Just like Cayenne, when she's up here dancing and waving her hand. How many adults would get up here and do the same thing like that? I know you would, Tara and Charles. I know y'all would. How many adults? I mean, you think about it though. Why can't we be like that? Why? Because we think, oh, you got to be reverent in church. Where does it say that? Because some guy back in the 1800s or whoever decided you can't talk in church, made it law, and everybody out there went from happy and joy to rigor mortis and died. You know, now we don't smile or, just, or wave our hands or say hallelujah or amen in church because we're scared somebody might look at us funny. We need to be like I am. We need to sit here, clap our hands, and wave our hands around and say hallelujah, amen, sing Jesus loves me all the time. We need to get back to that. Kids make us young again. You know what? Well, yeah, sometimes. But, you know, I heard one guy told me, he said, listen, he said, I was raising my grandkids, and he said, I figured out why, what happened. He said, you know, why people grow old. They quit playing. He said they quit playing. And you think about it. What keeps a kid youthful? The way they play, they have fun, that cheerful nature. That keeps them going. Adults, when we get old, when we get out of high school, when we start college, we're like, done, we quit playing. We become all serious. And then we get older, we're even worse. 
you know, it's time for us to get back be a kid again sometimes. Hey, I love watching cartoons. I do. But you see, that's part of communicating with your kids. Spending time with them. You know, growing, being youthful again. Brother Drew called me last night. It's midnight at the house, and me and Ethan were still up talking. And also my phone rings, and Drew's talking to me. He's about to go to preach in Africa. And he says, you know what? I just want to call and tell you a joke. I'm like, really? <laughs> he said, okay, what is it? He said, he said, what time of day did God create Adam? I'm thinking, I'm like, nighttime. He said, you're close, shortly before Eve. <laughs> <laughs> See, I made you people laugh. That's what it takes to be youthful again. Laugh. Laughter is the best medicine out there. You communicate with your kids. You joke around. You laugh. As a family, you have fun together. That's what it takes. That's how we communicate with each other. It's not always going to be serious all the time. You have fun. Who said church you can't laugh at church? No one. You Communication is fun. Talking to each other is fun. And, and that's what it takes to learn people. To learn someone, you have to communicate with them. And let me tell you something. You see kids today on a date, and this is how you see them. <laughs> They're texting each other across the table. Right. Because they don't know how to talk to each other. Hey, I ain't lying, y'all. That's real, that's a true story. Because they're not raised to talk. They were raised to text. They don't know how to call you and talk to you. I mean, my kids don't call me, they text me. I'm like, why don't you just call me? You get a text like this, I'm like, that's a mighty. I've got to read a novel. Just call me and tell me what's going on. Dad said they get it from me. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's what, you know, it is our fault. We give it to them. We gave them their freedom. We allowed it to do that. And that's where men, we had to step in. We had to set the boundaries. There are times where things need, where you have to say no. As much as you don't want to, you have to say no. You know, there's times where you, your kids want this, want that. Hey, no. You know, but there's times where even God is going to tell you no. Amen. Let me tell you something. There was a song out there a long time ago that said, thank God for unanswered prayers. I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad because son, some of them prayers I prayed for when I was younger, I'm glad he didn't answer them. But you see, fathers have to have that heartfelt talk with their children. You see, the children need to know that no matter how bad a situation is, that they're always loved. Amen. They're always loved. No matter how bad they mess up, they may get in trouble, but they're still loved. Amen. The second thing is, children need to know is no matter how bad the situation is, they can always come to dad with anything. That's the thing. You can come to me, I've told my kids, you come to me with anything. I don't care what it is, how bad it is, you come to me. We talk it out, I'll help you with it. Because I've been through a lot more stuff than, than Nana has. I know a lot more, a few more things. And I've told them, I said, y'all come to me. We will work through it, no matter what it is. That's how we have to be. Guess what, y'all? God's the same way. He wants us to come to him with anything. Amen. He doesn't want us to come to him perfect because we're not he wants us to come to him broken on the side of the road begging for help saying god help me he wants us to be like that third is submission you know in ephesians it says submit yourselves one to another in fear of god you know we have to be a you know when you look in genesis when God created man and woman, and he said, well, when they're married, they become one flesh. One flesh. Man and woman together. What do you think a family is? It's still one. It's still one unit. It's one team, one togetherness. It is family. It is built on a bond that should not be broken. No matter how bad it is, it shouldn't be broken. And that's the thing. You know, there's a lot of times where 
A lot of kids have had a hard life growing up because they have raised in abusive homes. And I hate that for them. I really do. But there's still a Heavenly Father that loves them, that will not abuse them, and will help them. And they need to know that. There's kids out there today that need to know that. But submission is when each person in the family gives himself or herself to service to the others when each one is willing to live for each other. But you see, it cannot be mandated. That's the thing. Submission cannot be forced on someone. Just like love cannot be forced on someone. You can't force someone to love you. And that's the thing. It, it has to be. It's, it's earned through trust, through kindness, through generosity, all this stuff. It has to be demonstrated. And I'm using mine and Ethan's example the other day, me and him in Harbor Freight. I'm buying tools to prep for tearing down tile in mom's bathroom. And we're sitting there, and a young man, uh, an elderly gentleman walks up to us and says, Hey, y'all got a second? He said, I'm trying to find something for a drill. So we sit there and talk to him. I mean, we this man went on and on and on for about 20 minutes about his kids and how they were in Africa and different places, Tanzania, traveled the world, and did all this stuff. And me and each just sit there and talk to him, listen to him. We were very courteous. And uh, he, one of the people in charge of the Kiwanis camp over there, invited us to go over there. Come to find out, I use this as an opportunity to teach Ethan how to always be kind to people, no matter who they are, strangers or not. Because when we later on found out, this guy was Mr. Trotter himself that started Trotter's Electronics in Alexandria. Never met the man in my life, but this was the, that man. And very big to do man, he knew half the people out here. And the thing is, you never know who you're talking to. You've got to raise your children to be courteous to people because you never know when you're entertaining angels. Amen. You have to raise your children to be kind to others, to help others, to be generous, generous to other people because, let me tell you something, being kind to someone goes a long ways. Amen. And it's like I told Ethan when we left that conversation, I said, Ethan, I said, you never know how much that might have helped that man today. You never know. He might needed somebody to talk to. He may have been having a bad day and just needed somebody to talk to. And we were that people. God's going to put you in every situation for a reason. How you act in that situation is going to show your relationship with you and God. You know, men, we're put in situations to lead the house. How we lead that house shows our relationship between us and God. Amen. Our family sees it. Our kids see it. Do our kids see you the same way God sees you? I mean, you look at it. We can fool everybody in public of how we act, how nice we are, but at home, that's the real you. You know, that's the thing. And that's why I told you all those examples of Billy Sunday and Nelson Mandela is because who you are in public is one thing. Who you are at home is what really matters. That's where it counts. Because that's where God put you in charge of. That's the home. Yeah. He didn't put you in charge of everything else out there. He put you in charge of the home first. Yeah. Brother Jerry told me one thing when I took on the mantle of preaching. And he said, never forget this. God never called you into ministry to lose your family. You see, your family will always come before the church. Right. Always. He said, that's the truth. You have to put the family first before anything in the ministry. Because God will never call you to anything to tear up your family. Right. And that's how we have to look at things. We have to be there for the families. We have to be right there with them. You see, it says, I can do all things through him that strengthens me. And it's so true. Lastly, I want us to look at it. We need to let them know that God is their strength in times of hardship. You know, there's some of us where we've had them hard days where we just looked up and said, why? Why, God? 
why. Everything's going wrong. Things are happening. Equipment's not acting right. Something's not going good. And he said, like, Lord, please give me a break. Let me catch a break. You know, we need to teach our kids to do the same thing. We got to let them know that God's always there for them. Because we can't be there for them 24-7. No, as much as we want to, we cannot protect them 100% of the time. But God can. And that's what we have to let them know. That they can turn to God for support during times of hardship. We have to teach them to rely on God as much as they rely on us. Because that's the most important thing in their lives. Because when they're in situations where they're scared to call mom and dad because they're scared mom and dad may get on to them, well, who are they going to turn to in that moment? Who are they going to turn to? You know, They need to know they can turn to God. God will give them the strength to call mom and dad to help them. God will instill a loving spirit in mom and dad to help them through that portion. You see, that's why we need to let our children know that God is on their side. He's always there for them. He says, training your kids, this way will lead them to having a life full of blessings instead of a life full of, with heartache. And that's the difference between a Christian home and a non-Christian home. Yes, a Christian home, it's not always easy to live in. It's hard sometimes, but it's not meant to be easy. You know, the straight and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. Straight and narrow is not the gate itself. Straight and narrow is that path, the entire life. Your life has to be lived through that straight and narrow. And it's hard. But it does come with a lot of blessings. Amen. And God does help you through the heartaches. He does give you peace through some of the hardest things in your life. But on the other side, when you don't live for God, there's no peace. There's lots of heartache. You may think you're getting blessings because you got more money than the people living next to you that are Christians. But all the devil's got to do is keep throwing money at you. And you, you that fake happiness is all you need to keep going. But in the end, it won't solve the problem. How are your families looking? That's the question. So man, I'll leave you with this. Are you leading your family the way God instructed you to? That's the question we have to answer today, man. We are called to be the head of the household. You look at churches today. You're lucky if you see 10 men in the church today. And some of them. You know, I was talking to Brother Drew. They may have a crowd of 200. And they're lucky if they got 20 men. That's just, that's their culture over there. It's the same thing here in America today. Why? Because the men don't want it anymore. Some think they're better than God. Some think they don't need God. And some of them just don't care. But I'm telling you, man, until you get your lives back right with God, your home life is going to suffer. Because when you suffer, everyone around you suffers. And that's the key. We have to get our lives straight so that our family's lives will be better. So are you leading your family the way God instructed you to? That's the question. Let us stand.